Okay, um, hi everyone. Thank you for joining us for this lunchtime lecture as part of the Stories About Sustainability series this autumn. Um, it's really exciting to do this in the lecture hall since the majority of the series is online, but um, today's speaker has flown all the way to come and join us. Um, so the series invites architects from around the world to look back at the materiality and craft of the past and see how it can inform more sustainable building practices now and in the future. And it's linked to the exhibition that's currently on view in the gallery um, across the way, uh, which is called, it's got the same title, it's called The Future is a Journey to the Past, Stories about Sustainability. And it was curated by Mario Cuccinella Architects. So um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Manishe Vergis. I'm the head of public engagement here at the AA. And I'm delighted to introduce today's speaker, Ken Yang, whose work focuses on how the ecology of the planet is the originating context and baseline upon which all human action and activities, technologies, and its built environment takes place. Today, he'll present his work developed from an ecology-based architecture designed through the biomimicry of ecosystems and presented in his recent books, Saving the Planet by Design, Reinventing Our Cities Through Ecomimesis, and At One with Nature, Recent Advances in Ecological Architecture in the Work of Ken Yang. Um, both of these books, as well as others, are available just across the corridor in the AA bookshop and are on a kind of special display above the fireplace. So after the talk, I encourage you to all go across and check it out. Um, and for those of you joining online, we can um, post a link in the YouTube so that you can also buy those online. So um, today, Ken will present um, how designing architecture through the biomimicry of attributes of ecosystems can enable the built environment to seamlessly and benignly integrate with the planet's natural environment and its biochemical cycles. His presentation will be followed by a conversation with Sarah Akibogan, founder of Studio Archie and professional practice tutor here at the AA. And um, they will talk about how we can approach designing for humanity's sustainable future. Um, before I hand over to Ken, a few logistics. Um, obviously, we're doing this in the room, so if um, I think after I hand over to Ken, he'll give his talk, followed by the conversation with Sarah, and at a certain point, she'll open up the conversation to those of you in the room. Um, please just raise your hand and I'll come with, to you with a microphone so that people on YouTube can hear you. And equally, if anyone on YouTube has a question, we'll keep an eye on the chat and we can ask that question on your behalf. So um, I guess for now, I'll just hand over to Ken. And since both Ken and Sarah are AA graduates, please join me in welcoming them back to the AA. Thank you very much for coming to listen to me talk. I'm going to talk about the work I've been working for a few years, um, which is on ecology-based design. Ecology-based design for me is designing with nature based on the science of ecology. I did my doctorate on this topic um, at Cambridge University, and in that, during that period of time that I was there, um, I attended lectures at the uh, Department of Environmental Biology, and I also attended McHart's course on ecological land use planning. Now, I need to sort of have this, you know, proviso because you know green design isn't the only thing in architecture, and and for a good design, you must do a number of things. They must function, it must work. Otherwise, it's a useless piece of hardware, and it must meet criteria such as health, public safety you know, cost, time, quality, construction, and so forth. It must be aesthetically fulfilling and inspiring. Now, this is very subjective, but that's why we are architects. We're artists at the same time. And then it must be um, a gender human well-being, which is health and happiness. And to me, that's probably the most important factor in design. And if you're able to make people happy and contribute to their well-being, then your whole purpose of being an architect is justified. So now, people ask me, why ecology? Well, the planet's ecology is this original context. Everything takes place here. Whether it's our building construction, or our technology, our lives, our activities. And the viability of life on the planet is dependent on its ecological health. And so everything takes place, and understanding the ecology of the planet is extremely important, and it's one of the crucial things that we have to recognize as human beings. So now let's we'll start with nature. The ecologist sees the Earth as covered by this thin film called the biosphere, where organisms exist, live, 
And within this um, biosphere, there are units in nature called ecosystems. And ecosystem consists of communities of plants and animals, or as ecologists define it, as the biotic constituent and the abiotic of, of, you know, of animals and, and microbes. And, and then the physical environment with the climate, the geology, and the soils. Now, these two factors act together as to form a whole. And that's the difference between a biological system and a technological system, because the holistic property is that most technological systems don't have. Now, these two components, these two constituents, work together in very complex ways that you, know, you, you and I can't see it, because a lot of it takes place in nature. But you have to know that this exists. Okay. Now, added to this, that's us as human beings. Of course, we are one of the species of nature, but we're the most powerful of all species. We change landscapes, we change waterways, we change climate, we change you know, um, sea levels. And so, if we have this amazing power, as Spider-Man says, it has to be exercised with great care. Now, we as human beings, we make things we make more things than any other species in nature. I call it the built environment, but we make artifacts, we make food, we make toys, we make cameras, we make you know, machines, we make things. Now, it is the, um, what do we do with all the things we do? We throw it into the physical environment, we throw it in, into, the, um, into the biosphere, we throw it away. But in nature, there's no way. The biosphere is a closed system, so it has to go somewhere. So it's this conflict between everything that we throw away in a very callous manner that has affected the ecology of the planet. So this became the, the, the challenge for me. Where do we go from here? And so the thought that occur, occurred to me, the thesis that I have, is that what happens we made our, we make our built environment, repurpose it to imitate, become constructed ecosystems. So if you construct ecosystems as constructed ecosystems, then you would biointegrate in a seamless, benign way with nature. So that is the principle of what I'm trying to do. Of course, this is a challenge. It's much easier said than done, but that's what we're trying to do. So I started to look at what are the properties that we need to emulate. I call this not biomimicry, but I call it ecomimicry because you emulate you know, the properties of ecosystems. And so these are some of the properties we need to emulate, like the biological structure of nature, of ecosystems, biodiversity, its connectivity, provision ecosystems, services, and so forth. And so that then becomes my life's work. How do we interpret these? How do we interpret these in built form, spatially and both um, in three-dimensionally? And so um, it occurred to me then, if I look at the first property, which is the biological structure, and that nature, as I said, consists of body constituents, a body constituents, that everything that we make and do, including this room that we're in, is abiotic. Everything is inorganic except you made the bugs. So if we were to, if we were to emulate, replicate, and augment the built environment to become constructed ecosystems, then we have to, first thing we need to do is to add more biotic constituents because that's the single most important missing constituent. And so our work then starts with creating habitats within the built environment. Habitats could be in the sky, could be, I mean, in the roof, in the, in the sky course, within the building, on the ground, in the basements. And so creating habitats is ex extremely, uh, as, you know, aspect of ecological design. So how do we do this? So I started to look at patterns for achieving this. You can plot it on one location, as you can see with the building on the left-hand side or in Central Park in New York. But you could have a series of green squares, as you can see here in the Bloomsbury area, you have Houston Square, you know, Bedford Square, um, Russell Square. So the equivalent is to have a patchy relationship in buildings. The third is what I call stepping stone. You, they're close but not quite connected, but enable certain species to move from one patch to another patch. The other one is, I call it a tree structure, where you have a spine, you have fingers sticking out, 
But the ideal relationship is the one which is this one because it, it is connected. But being connected in engenders a much more larger pool of natural resources for sharing between the species by enabling larger pools of resources. It then generates a much more stable ecosystem. And as you can see in that upper diagram, you know, in terms of planning, you should have an ecological corridor with ecological fingers. So with these diagrams as a starting point, I start to look at you know, how do we um, interpret that into building form. And so the early experiment you know, was to try and see uh, how we could link it together. But we should link not just at the ground plane, but almost uh, also vertically at the same time. So in this way, we, we recreate the Earth, we create all our cities as constructed ecosystems. And so, you know, people ask me, how do you green a city? Green a city, not just by looking at the waste, looking at energy, but you start by looking at, at the bi biological uh, uh, um, uh, uh, framework, biological relationship. So you can add greenery, then you, it's increasingly you, you um, create habitats, you, you try to integrate these, and finally the city then becomes the construct ecosystem. So that is the principle. And this is a drawing of how it could look like with eco bridges, eco, eco uh, green areas, and so forth. And I'm not going to go through this because it bore you to tears. And so back in 1985, I started to see, well, how do we put greenery in the buildings? So this is the building that we did, it was just Minara Bowstead, and we started to put vegetation in the balconies. And that, um, you know, these are the balconies, and then these are the um, green areas. But again, it is not, it is not, uh, it is not a desirable situation because it, they're disparate, they're, you know, they're, 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 they're not connected. And so I started to look at um, how we could maybe have a stepping stone relationship. This is another building that we did in 1985, the IBM building, where we had a series of step planters going all the way up, goes up one side, then goes another across the floor, and then goes up to the top of the building. Now, the next thing I want to think about to do is how do we enhance the biodiversity of a location? This is a histogram that shows that biodiversity increases. Uh, you know, this is a histogram of the biodiversity of butterflies, but it increases as we head towards the equator. So the equator around that area has the highest level of biodiversity. For instance, in the UK, you're 50 to 2 degrees above the equator. You are reasonably diverse, but not as biodiverse compared to the tropics. So this is a project that we did, we finished about a few years back, and it was an experiment project for us. Uh, the idea was to create habitats within the sky courts, within the roof, within the ground. And the building lies um, in Putrajaya, in the axis from the, between the, uh, the, the plaza and the, the monument, Millennium Monument at the far end of the, of the, uh, of, of the axis. So that explains the building form of the building. We had to respect this axis and, 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 and put the building between the, 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 the axis. And at the axis, the actual monument was also designed by us about eight years back. Then, um, so we started to do research. So we started to create habitats, as I said, you know, within the, uh, within the, built, within the built form and um, these are different habitats in the buildings, and these are the different habitats in terms of plan. And you can see the habitats, which are red color, marked in red on the top of the um, the top of this uh, diagram. Then we do research on the faunal species that we want to bring back to this site, which are not hazardous human beings. Now, um, so to do this, you have to, you have to. Uh, do research on the surrounding ecology of the site. Then the next would be to find the floral species that attract the faunal species. So having identified the floral species, we look at how they interact with the habitats. With the habitats, then we look at, use that as a basis for designing the local landscape and habitat. So in this way, the whole building then becomes a constructed living system or as, a, as an almost like an organic system. One of the ideas we had was what we call the eco-cell. Now this was our master plan for the uh, competition for the Calhoun waterfront. We didn't win the competition, I think we were honorary, had an honorary mention. But eco-cell is basically um, 
a void that you cut from the roof of the building going all the way down to the basement that brings vegetation down to the basement, brings natural ventilation, brings daylight, and at the bottom of it you could have a, a living machine or a bias rail. So this was the eco, this was the eco cell idea. And that's the way eco cell it is in, in this project, and this is what it looks like. You can see the vegetation continuously weaving all the way up from the third floor all the way down to the basement. Um, the building lies along two axes, the axis to the Prime Minister's office, which is along the boulevard, and then the, uh, an angle axis down to the waterfront to, to, to the, um, the Millennium Monument. And then this is the green area between the, uh, between the two buildings, which are green, and to create a lively space, and it's lined with food and beverage outlets on the edges. And then the metaphor for the building is a, is a gem. We wanted to make it look upmarket, and so it has a facet look for it. And of course, the danger of faceting is that you, you, the hazard of doing that is that your internal space has become difficult partition. And then um, to, to, to give it a cultural feel, we took the socket pattern from the Malay community and, and put it as a fitted pattern on the glass. But it's a double skin building. So you can see between the double skin, that's a passageway. And then you have the fitted glass on the outside. It's not butt jointed, there's a gap so that you know, air can flow through. And that uh, for, you know, the middle, the third, the third image is, is looking from the inside looking out, so you can still see the out. And, uh, and the last image is, is the uh, fitted pattern from the outside looking in. The west side, you know, to, to address the hot western sun, we angle the, uh, the, uh, the fritter glass. And so, in some ways, you could actually tell which is north and which is south, east and west, by looking at the facade of the building. These were the energy studies. The typical office building in Malaysia uses about 160 cold hours per square meter per annum. And this, with this design, with the double skin, uses about 130, so it's about 70% less, 30% less. That's access to the monument. That's the money at the end. And then in front of the monument at the back, you know, um, across the site is the Ministry of Finance building. And um, we did the monument about eight years earlier. And the monument was based on the metaphor or, or, or the aesthetic of the national flower, which is the uh, hibiscus. And so you can see a ramp at the bottom of the, of the, of the tower um, so that you can walk up you know, to the top of the tower. To, to, the, to the bottom of the tower. So then this pattern intrigued me and I said, how do we interpret this? So this was the building we did for us, for the Scandinavian uh, telco company, DG, and the idea was to have a green wall that zigzags from one side, goes to the other side, goes to the back, and goes back to the same base again. Um, so this is the tree structure, this is the Skyline building, it's under construction now, and it's the idea of a spine with fingers sticking out, and the fingers then goes up to sky courts, which then collects rainwater, which is half a step within the building. So these are the sky courts of the building. Now, this is the research we did to identify the species for, the, for this project. So we did research on the you know, surrounding area to, to the site, which is that little red dot the top diagram. And then we look at the green areas adjoining the site. And so we start to look at what sort of species we can bring back uh, in terms of birds and, and animals. And so the focus was then on birds. The idea then was that this is the biodiversity matrix. The idea was that for lower floors, we would have butterflies and dragonflies. And then the middle floors would be the uh, songbirds. And the last floor would be for migratory birds. So in this way, we could bring fauna into, the, into a vertical building. And that's the entertainment floor, which is the last floor where we had four pools. We had a family pool, we had a lap pool, we had a children's pool, and a jacuzzi pool, and that's a small mini amphitheater. So the last diagram is the continuous pattern. Um, how do you achieve this in, 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 in a building? So this is the scheme that we designed at Waterloo Road uh, in, uh, in Singapore. It's the EDIT building, and uh, the idea for this project was to have a ramp of planting the spirals all the way up to the top of the building. So these were the floor plans. And the idea was that whenever you know, the, the, the ramp reaches the same level as the adjoining buildings, we would bridge across and green the roofs of the building so that the whole building becomes a catalyst for making the city green. Well, that was the idea. You know, nobody quite used it yet. So. Then we did the, it took us about eight years from that building to, to, to do this building. This is the Solaris building in Singapore. 
And, um, and the idea was again to have a ramp, a vegetable ramp that with every facade we, cl we climb one floor. So this goes continuously all the way up. This was the venture building that was built eight years after the uh, Edith Tower. And this is the, uh, the vegetation that climbs up on the facade. This, was the, this is the inspirational drawing that we did where we had the, the vegetative ramp. But this time, as a, for the development for the Edith Tower, we had a walkway. The walkway then we could service the planting without going through the, the use of floors. And so that was the intention of this. And, um, Finally, it got built, and here it is. You can see the walkway, you can see the vegetation, you can see inside the floor and the sun shading on top. This is the vegetation on the, on the, uh, along the walkway. And then the spiraling ramp hits the mid-level garden. This is the mid-level garden. And then from there, it works its way up to the top of the building, which is just another garden. Now, in Singapore, they have, they have, a, they have a center called Green Mark in which you know, you have to have a vegetation index of six. In this project, we got 12. So to me, a vegetation system, whether it's LEED or BREAM or Green Mark or, or, or Green Index, it's just, it's just an arbitrary uh, a figure that somebody, you know, uh, put into the criteria. You need to exceed it as much as we can. So this is what we did with this project. We had 12 and, um, and then, now, it's pretty boring to have a linear you know, path going all the way to the top. So what we did was that we, we for certain corners, we opened up into a mini plaza. So we called this a, a, a linear path. And so that, you know, if you stretch out this, this ramp, it's about 1.3 kilometers long, uh, and then linear path, then these people on the outside could actually interact with people inside. And, and you have tables there, you can have, okay, you can have um, uh, you can have a snack there or a meal there. You can have a puff there if you wanted to. And so, you know, so the whole building then becomes, you know, a, a linear park. And uh, this is the, one of the sky courts. Now, the, actually, the, building is the, the whole building is actually two portions separated by an atrium. The master plan for the site was done by a famous Iraqi architect, made of mine, Zaha Hadid. And, and uh, so that determined the shape of the building, optimized the permissible floor ratio. But between the building, the two buildings is this atrium. The atrium is what I call a mixed mode. It's not fully air conditioned, partially air conditioned. We have cold air blown in the atrium. But on a normal day, the hot air can go out. So it's automated so that you know, the louvre is open. But in the event of inclement weather, it automatically shuts. And so this stops the rain from coming down. So now, so that is a mixed mode building. And then we started to look at uh, other aspects, attributes, but intimacy. Now, the one that I have highlighted, ha highlighted here is the provision of ecosystem services. And uh, around the year 2000, ecologists start, you know, around the world started to group together the services. Ecosystem services are what things nature does for us as human beings without any human intervention. Nature does enormous number of things, you know. It produces oxygen, it sequesters, it sequesters um, pollution from the air uh, through uh, photo phytoremediation. Now, it's impossible for us as human beings to imitate this technologically. We can never have enough technology that can produce the oxygen the way that nature does it, absorbs the pollution from the, air, from the atmosphere, even though a lot of scientists are, are designing uh, carbon capturing systems. So what do we do? If we continue to destroy nature, continue to remove you know, uh, the, the landscape, you know, nature's ability to provide ecosystems is, is being reduced. And so I thought, well, if we can't, make, you, you can't imitate nature, we should make use of it. So we should go back to this diagram I, I had earlier on, where we had ecological um, fingers which eats into the, into the built environment. So the idea was to weave the, the, the natural environment and the built environment together like two class hands. And so you know, this is the scheme that we did at the La Reunion, which is an island east of Madagascar. We had collected all the vegetation along the, uh, on the waterfront and brought a series of fingers into, 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 the, into the built environment. 
And so this was the idea that we had, you know, nature coming in as a finger and the built environment going out, you know, as a series of fingers too. So in this way, nature is right in the proximity of the built environment to provide ecosystem system services to, to, to the uh, built environment. Now, if you take London, for example, you know, there are two places where you can get uh, ecosystem services, Hyde Park and Regent's Park, or Green Park and Green Park as well, but they're miles away from, from Hackney or from Shoreditch, you know. And so there are parts of London which can receive the ecosystem service, whereas by putting it next to each other, you have this proximity. So, the, the, you know, this was the idea, uh, and that this, uh, this is the plan of the uh, built environment uh, with the natural system, and this is the pattern of the built environment of the... Uh, and then the idea then, as I mentioned earlier, wants to bring nature in to, towards the insides of the island, and we bring the built environment right down, to, weaving next to each other, cheek by jowl, if you like, um, at this you know, calculated dimension we have, where the built environment is about 30 meters and, and, the, and the green area is about 20 plus. Now, the edges should not be pristine because you, know, you must be wavy, must be articulated so that species can hide, species can breathe, species can, can interact you know, within this built environment. So the next thing then comes what I call eco-infrastructure. You see, what is happening in our city now is that we have an existing structure that's not particularly green. So what architects do is that they build green buildings, which is admirable, and they just plug them into the infrastructure, sharing some of the energy they, they accumulated and some energy they, have, you know, uh, um, they get from rene renewable sources. But what we should do is that we should start with green infrastructure. Because if the infrastructure is, is not green, then the, the city will never become green. And so ecological design not starts with buildings, but with, with the infrastructure. We should make the infrastructure green first, then anything else you add to it that makes the city greener. And so we should stop thinking about just doing green buildings. We should start with green infrastructure. So with master plan, with any urban environment, we should start by making infrastructure green. And so these are the five infrastructures that we need to bring together and biointegrate as a whole. There's nature, which is the ecological systems, the biogeochemical cycles, the human society, our social, economic, political, institutional systems that we should somehow bring into the, into the equation. Then there's water, because even water is part of nature. I bring it up because water is what life is all about. When astronomers look into the sky, the first thing they look at, at any planet, any asteroid, is that are there signs of water? Because if there's the signs of water, there is organic life. So water is very important. We need to close the roof. We need to have net zero water. And then there is our built environment. Built environment is everything that we make and do as human beings. Our buildings, our artifacts, <coughs> our clothing, our shoes, our, our iPods, and our food. The finest energy, because we are addicted to energy. We cannot live without energy. And so the energy has to be part of this equation. So ecological design is how we bring all this together into a whole, which I call biointegration. And herein lies a challenge because you know, I, I, I've been working in this field for a few years and I still can't answer all these questions. I'm dependent on your next generation, and you, the next generation, to help me do this, to see this as something as crucial for surviving human beings. Now, this is the master plan we did uh, in, in Bangalore, and it's, it's a development next to um, Forest Reserve. So, for the same principles, the first thing we did was we collected all the species by this corridor next to the Forest Reserve, and we stretched it across the site. Stretched it across the, in a series of ecological fingers, reaching to the end so that the potential of linking to adjoining sites, you know, is there. So, in this way, the whole area then becomes a connected ecosystem because nature, as I said, nature is connected. And so this is the master plan. You can see the uh, green areas. And, all, you know, and then um, the idea was to bring it, you know, with the, uh, have the uh, corridor and bring it across to the edge of the end of the site. Now, um, this is, what happens is that when, when a road bifurcates your green finger, then, then you, you know, the connectivity isn't there. So we had to address this issue. 
So the answer we had was to have what we call eco bridges, so that in the vegetation you can go from the species and vegetation can go from one part of the site to the other part of the site, and still the road can go through underneath. So this is what the eco bridge looks like, and so that's the uh, that's the integrated pattern that we had for the uh, for the master plan. So now, for, for complex projects, for large projects, we do what we call ecological analysis. We go from analyzing ecology, analyzing the natural drainage, analyzing the, uh, the slope of the land, and then, you know, as you see in the diagram, is what I call a slope analysis, which then tells you which parts of the site you can build without excessive retaining walls, without excessive earth cutting. So in this way, you know, uh, ecology design actually is commercially uh, 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 um, uh, vibe, you know, uh, uh, interesting proposition. And the diagram on the left and the right hand side is we will derive a plan that shows areas suitable for development in areas that we must not touch because it affects the ecology, affects the natural drainage, affects the earthworks. And so at the bottom we had three alternative master plans that we present to the client. So now, what are the properties that, that we have to emulate? It's interacting with climate because the, you know, nature's ecosystems are not the same throughout the whole world. They all react to the climate of the locality, which determines the faunal species, the floral species, the water regime for that particular locality. And so, how do we design with climate? So, these are this is my method for designing with climate. Um, it is it goes from, if you like, you know, from. Uh, Passive mode, external, look at external environment, we look at passive mode to mixed mode to productive mode. And so a simplified diagram is like this, where you go from, you study embodied energy because you want to hit towards low embodied energy. It's possible to achieve uh, you know, uh, net zero energy, but you have to start with so much technology to achieve it. So you want to have minimal you know, stuffing of uh, technology, you want to have minimal embodied energy. So you, as you can see, you go from left to right, from passive mode, to mix mode, to um, to productive, to, to 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 optimizing your your full mode, to heading towards productive mode, which is productive means you generate your own energy from renewable sources, and so now diagrammatically this is what is in UK. You have a jolly cold winter. You have a very hot summer, so that's you know, and that's what the blue line means. But what engineers tell us to do is that we must have consistent temperature, humidity, and, 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 and air change throughout the whole year, which is that red line. That is the high energy solution. So one of the things you have to do is to start with design the climate of the place. I call this a climatic design or bioclimatic design, but have no qualms about this. Bioclimatic design can never equal full mode. So you can improve comfort conditions a little bit, as you can see in this uh, second line. So next is you have some mechanical electric systems. I call it mixed mode. So you can further improve the comfort condition, but start to use a little bit of energy to make systems. And then this is the full mode where you have to be as efficient systems as you can, and you have to use low embodied energy as much as low embodied energy as you can, and you have to use smart systems so that it, it, it becomes you know, a low energy building. And then this is, uh, mixed mode, uh, this is full uh, productive mode where you start to generate your own energy. So that's the last step in this process. Now back to this building that we, back, we did back in 1985. Um, this is the floor plan. Uh, what we did was that we took out all the columns, so the column free floor, which is good for financial institutions, organizations, and then we had planting on the outside. But this is not an ideal design, as I mentioned. You know, it's patchy. The species can move from one part to the other part. But at that time, I was interested in, 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 in bioclimatic design. We started to study how the core positions can affect the energy performance of the building. And so you can see, I put the course on the east and west side. You look in the middle, you can see the sun path of location. And so, you know, the sun is a third of the days on, on the east, a third of the day is on top, and a third of the day is on the bottom. So, so we used the lift course and staircase as buffers. On the left hand side, you see the diagrams showing the different core positions, the different orientation. And you can see the red, the red box shows the diagram orientated north south. 
which has the lowest energy consumption. So we started to explore different built forms. So we said, what happens if we um, design a building like an umbrella? And that is my you know, golden chalice, that if I can achieve an umbrella building, which is automated and adjusts itself during the time of the year. You know, that is something I always wanted to do, but I haven't got around to being, having the ability to do that. So this was an umbrella building where we had a louver umbrella. The idea was to let in the morning sun, is the louver's angle, morning sun, keep out the afternoon sun, the louver's in the middle, and then let in the evening, you know, keep out the afternoon, hot afternoon sun. So this was back, done back in 1985. A more recent uh, solution would be the uh, a canopy that we did, uh, entrance statement uh, to an apartment building. Well, this was done a few years back. This is a competition that we won for the University of Malaya where we, we took the fritted glass idea and we put it horizontally, it became a horizontal canopy over the university hub. This was our design for a canopy over station. Uh, this is the canopy that we designed for, over the Xiong'an station south of Beijing, uh, which is where the new capital city would be. And so, the, and so, so these were mixed mode uh, solutions. And one of the mixed mode solutions we did um, was, uh, was the Great Ormond Street Children's Hospital further down the road here, where we, we took the pleasant climate of the mid-seasons, which is spring and autumn. We try and extend it as much into the cold season, the hot season as possible. So we reduce the period for heating, reduce the period for cooling, and using natural ventilation to, make, to extend it. And so this is, the, uh, oh, this is another scheme in, uh, where we use uh, ceiling fans and, and side fans. We, we, we did studies to show you know, to what extent we, we can achieve coolness by using fans. And this is a scheme that we're working on right now. It's an existing retail where the blue areas shows all the air conditioned areas. So the client said, what happens if we lower the energy consumption because we can still tolerate not, you know, a comfort condition about 27, 29 degrees. So the idea was that we created mixed mode zones where we had ceiling fans, you know, in this area to, to, to still provide comfort condition, not exactly 23 degrees as you would have in those air condition, uh, conditions, but, you know, it's still reasonably cool. And so this was the idea to use mixed mode. This is the Great Ormond Street Children's Hospital extension, which is just down the road here. But this time we put the flu right on the facade of the building. So it sucks the air up so that the lower three floors, which is occupied by Walt Disney, become a, a mixed mode zone. And so the, you, know, you can see the valve at the bottom of, the, of, of this um, flu, and then on the right hand side, there's the valve on top of the building. So finally, for, for, um, for, for productive mode, where we generate our own energy, um, and that uh, this is the data center which is working on now, it's under construction. We put a solar photovoltaic canopy on top. To make this work, the canopy has, the, the photovoltaic area has to be at least 60% of your gross flow area. So, so we had to stick it out, there, you know, push the canopy out in order to get the 60% photovoltaic area. And then, then we started to look into the use of embodied um, embodied glass with embodied photovoltaics. And this idea was that the building itself, itself becomes a power station. So that it generates positive energy. And so then we look at water. Yeah, this is the water in the earlier master plan bungalow. We need to close the loop as fast as we can within the system. And anything that goes outside, we bring it back to the ground. Now what is happening here in most development is that the water falls on the ground, goes to the drains, drains go to the rivers, and it's gone forever. But in nature, the, falls, the nature of water falls on the ground, goes back into the ground to recharge the ground water. So that's what we should be trying to do. And so here in this project here, we have a number of detention ponds that bring the water back into the ground. The black water is treated as a series, as a, what I call a constructed wetland, where it goes through a series of purification ponds without any mechanical system. So that by the time we reach the last pond, it comes on in you know, pure water. And so that is um, the idea. What implementation? I just learned from my friend here, Chiwa, who was telling me about implementation the other day. Ecology-based design as an environmental holistic uh, thinking requires a holistic, environmental holistic thinking because we look at it as a whole, complete. Holistic, opposite holistic is incremental. 
And so we have to think holistically, and that's, the, that's, the, that's ecological design, that's for you. And so we have to look at the build construction, build environment, in relation to the biosphere, in relation to the ecological systems. Now, ecomimicry means we have to remake the built environment as constructed ecosystem by emulating, replicating, augmenting ecosystem attributes. So these are some ecosystem attributes that I have um, identified. But I can only do so much within the limited time that I have. In red are those attributes that I have not yet been able to interpret it in design. So you would like this my agenda for the next few years. Now, implementation, the last one is um, solutions to provide um, ecosystem services. That is the most biggest challenge that we all have at the moment. That, you know, these are the ecosystem services. If we're able to emulate this one way or the other, we are heading towards solving, saving the planet. I can do so much, you know, as, as one person in one company, but I hope that you as the next generation could help me do this. And we haven't got much, much we haven't got much time. We've got maybe about 30 to 50 years left before all the air becomes toxic, the waterways become you know, contaminated, um, we have lost all the vegetation that we have. We really don't have very much time, maybe 30 to 50 years. And so ecology-based design is dependent upon effective and seamless integration. That's like you can see this diagram here. And it's a challenge. Next is not human based action and and um, and consensus. Now what happens we've got everything right, we've got technology right, we've got everything right. What happens if we as human beings don't behave ourselves? We contaminate the environment. And so ecological design is not just about technology, it's not about design, it's about you and me as human beings. That's the most important thing we have to address. And the last thing I just learned from my friend the other day is the economics. <laughs> this man taught me everything I know, you know. <laughs> <laughs> because if it's too expensive, nobody will pay for it. So how to make it economical? That is the, then the other challenge. So I'm going to end a minute. Thank you very much for attending me. You can, you can all leap off and have lunch. <laughs> Can I just invite Sarah here? She's going to ask me embarrassing questions. <laughs> Try not to be too, too okay. embarrassing. Um, so, uh, Sarah's an architect. Hello, everyone. I'm the architect. And, uh, she uh, teaches at AA. Um, she's the smartest woman I know. <laughs> <laughs> he says that to everyone. Um, gets, but, you every, uh, <laughs> gets you everywhere, you know? <laughs> Anyway, go ahead. All so, right, darling, go ahead. Th oh. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction, Ken. And thank you very much for your um, inspiring lecture and for that, um, your call to action to the next generation. Um, I, uh, so we're here to talk about biomimicry and sustainability and, you know, how we save the planet. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> but I wanted to start by kind of circling back um, if, if I may, to your, to your origins. We kind of talked about that um, a little bit at the, at the beginning. We had a bit of a chat. And um, so we both studied here in this yes. fabulous place. Right. But we're also both from other places. We, well, I, I was born here, but... Um, I live in Mayfair. <laughs> oh, sorry, something joking. No, that's all right. I'm, <laughs> I'm from Hackney. I'm from yeah, okay. But right. no... Um, um, so I'm kind of second generation British. Right. And you um, are from Malaysia. And Apo I wonder. I'm an apocryphal Englishman. <laughs> uh, you know, okay, carry on. No, but my, so my question was going to be um, so about your journey, how you came to, to study architecture here in London, and then how that, how kind of where you've come from has influenced your work going well, forward. But we'll, we'll take it kind of okay. stage by stage. How did you come stage to be by stage. in London studying architecture? Well, um, I came to the UK when I was 12 years old. 
I went to public school here and uh, was time of my life. Um, you know, I didn't knew about women until I was seven, 17. Um, sorry, I didn't mean that. It sounds terribly sexist. Um, but it was a very strict school, which is military driven. And uh, so when I came to AA, it was, it was you know, it was, it was a liberation. I could do whatever I like, whenever I like. So I did my three years here. So then I went to intern in Singapore for my father's architect, who was designing a hotel for my father in Penang. And um, now, my boss in Singapore had about four people working in the office, but he had an enormous amount of work. He had a senior draftsman who just ran everything. And so the junior senior draftsman became my mentor. I did everything. I designed buildings, I designed apartments, I supervised buildings, I, I chaired meetings. So now that is the advantage of being at the AA. I came back after my third year, arrogant like hell, full of myself, and I went to the registrar and I said, um, Rose, Rose Draper was the registrar at that time, I want to take my fifth year exams in the first term of my fourth year because I think it's a walk in the park. <laughs> She says, well, I don't think so, she says, but, uh, but A being the place as it is, she says, of course you can do it, but you need a tutor to supervise you, to, to, to support you. So I got, finally I asked around, Cyril Bernal was my, uh, you, my, civil, my uh, supervisor refused to do it. So I finally found Ron Heron and Ingrid Morris. You know, these are just names which have more mean, meaningful to people of my generation. Ron Heron is from the Archigram group. Ron Harris says, well, Ken, if you pass, you pass, you don't pass, you no skin off your nose. I said, well, that's, a, that's very, you know, you know um, magnanimous of you, Ron. So, so I, and so that winter was the winter of discontent. No power station, you know, there was a strike, there was no electricity, no light, you know, from six o'clock until six o'clock the next day. So there was, you know, in, 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 in my little apartment in Finchley, I was drawing with a tea sweat, a candle on one side, a candle on the other side. My mum was making coffee for me at hourly intervals. And so in that period from September to December, I designed a hospital at Milton Keynes. I designed a, a housing project at Lens at the bottom of Kings Road. I designed a, a cinema at Kensington. I did um, a temporary structure uh, at Camden. Then I had to write, you know, they have to write a history thesis. So I wrote a history, song, a history thesis on the metabolist group, in which the architect, one of the topics was Kisho Kulka, who became my friend the other day. I mean, he became my friend. And um, then I wrote my technical essay on the uh, on design methods. Kisho Kurukawa became my friend and um, as you know, the English press can be very, very critical. And there was this nasty article about Kishu Kurukawa that says that his name is like opening a cold can of beer. Kishu Kurukawa. Wow. <laughs> and, that, that's, uh, and then, and then uh, design methods that John Starling, not John Starling, John Starling was head of that graduate school, he said, you should meet uh, um, you know, uh, this guy who, who's... who's um, John Fraser? No, 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 who was also working on, uh, what, on, on technical aspects. And he became Secretary General for, uh, of, of the ICANN. And so I passed, and the whole school was stunned. How could anybody in the first term of fourth year pass his fifth year exams? It doesn't have to be a great design, doesn't have to be what, but provided I meet the criteria. So if you knew how to play the game, or you could just, you know, fulfilled requirements. They can't fail you. I, I, I think that's fascinating what you've just said, this, this thing about if, if you knew how to play the game, because yes. I think that um, anyone who's been an architect for yes. a while or is e even a student will yeah. um, kind of rapidly learn that there is a kind of game going on. Yeah, understand the criteria, address it, and you're there. And so the school was stunned. What are we going to do with you? We can't give you a diploma because you have to finish, you know, your two years here. So, you know, soon after that, 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 uh, that event, I was at a, you know, I was at a, at a bar upstairs, 
And the bus is an amazing place in the evening, you know, especially on a Friday evening. You meet just about every architect in town. Everyone. Yeah, I was just walking around, you know, um, trying to get pissed. And, and John said to me, um, I've heard about you, Ken. I said, oh, yeah, that's very nice, John. And so John says, why don't you come work for me in Cambridge? And so I went to work. So, you know, this was in May, by September, I was a research, you know, research worker at Cambridge University. And um, now, John and Alex Pike were working on the Autonomous House Project, which is a, a, an idea mooted by Buckness the Fuller. And they got a Science Research Council grant. And so I was working on it. And after three months, I said, John, all you're doing is just technology of, of sustainability. How about ecology? How about environment? But John wasn't particularly interested in it, and neither was Alex. So I said, would you mind if I just resign from the Technical Research Division and I become a research student to do a doctorate on ecological design planning? That's what I did. So three and a half years later, um, you know, I, I, uh, my thesis, my dissertation becomes my, became my life agenda. Indeed. So, so that's how I got into that, That's how you got that. Into um, and what I was fascinated by, so, you know, we think of sustainability and preserving the ecology and so on as being a very sort of current debate. It is a very kind of current question. But, you know, you were writing your PhD thesis at Cambridge in the, in the 1970s. And, you know, that was a time of great kind of, um, there were lots of student protests, there was lots of... Um, Kind of upheaval. You talked about the winter of discontent, 1973, and I, I just wondered. Can't do that. Could you open it for me? And I, I just wondered um, whether you were or how you were affected My by that. God. Whether you were part of that. A muscle milieu, woman. Whether that was um, something that was part of the milieu here at the AA. Whether you know what sort of conversations were going on at Cambridge. How did you make that pivot? What was it that? You know, why ecological design? Well, I already explained that I, you know, ecology was, I concluded ecology was the subject I was interested in. Yeah. But at that time, this was, you know, there was the by Britain years. There was Macmillan and Harold Wilson. And um, it was Cadby Street, that's King's Road. And there's the Beatles, there's Rolling Stones, and there's Woodstock. So that was an exhilarating that. period for me. Um, it was a terrible experience because, you know, that means, you know, I'm a, uh, I'm a lazy, fair person. I, could, you know, I just people do what they like, however they like, whenever they like, and whenever they like. So that's 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 the terrible way to bring up children. I tell you that. Um, so that's how I got into uh, into doing uh, writing my dissertation. I attended courses on environmental biology at the uh, Cambridge University. Then uh, later on, I went for a shot. I stayed for a short while at the University of Pennsylvania to study McHugh's uh, ecological land use technique. McHugh was, was a landscape architect. He invented the ecological land use planning technique. Yeah. But he, because he was not an architect, he, he couldn't bring it as far, he got it as fast as he could, but couldn't take it up to the, to the level of architecture, which I, th you know, without, um, without being, uh, being, um, I can't remember the word for it. Um, you picked up the, the mantle, let's say. Yeah, well, no, I continued. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Here you <laughs> Got a job in my office, you know that. <laughs> <laughs> so you, okay, so... I'm so up to, to the level of building design, which is my contribution to, to ecological design. Indeed, a, a small contribution. But um, it... Very small. Yeah. <laughs> it goes on to be your... Never do that in front of a man, you know, because he gets very upset. It goes on to be your <laughs> life's work. Um, Focusing on focusing on ecology. Yes, ma'am. Um, so you're you're kind of there. At the you know this is the sort of um, I was going to say the zeitgeist of, of the time, or at least it, you know Pennsylvania where you were is the, the, yes. sort, the sort of birth of um, kind of in, environmental design, yeah. let's say. Um, and then you go on to apply some of the, the theories that you learnt there. You you initially apply those to roof roof house, which you which you showed us there very briefly on the screen, which was your house. Could, um, what I find interesting about that is this idea of the umbrella, and I wondered where that came from, and specifically um, what I'm thinking about is whether that had to do with your own kind of um, cultural context, where you sort of 
um, you know, where you started and how much you were influenced by that in your yeah. thinking as, a, as an architect? Well, it's very difficult to talk about your cultural context because I'm neither Asian now, I'm neither European, mm. you know, I'm sort of like, you know, mid-Pacific, mid if you like. Um, it's funny how, you know, the English calls call the Far East, Far East. What do they call the U.S. Far West? You know? And so, um, extremely difficult for me. So, you know, I... Uh, you're so you're, you're I, I, you global, know, global. Yeah, maybe in, I speak Cantonese, but I, I don't speak Mandarin. I speak a little bit of Hokkien. Um, I had to do French at, uh, at, uh, at public school. And so a little bit of this, a little bit of that. So you're re really a kind of product of this sort of cross fertilization of ideas? Well, something like that. Lo yes, lots okay. Of, lo right. Lots of places. Um, yeah. And then you, which, which is something that, that, that we have in, in, in common, I would say. So um, oh, yes. I um, originally, well, so my, my family are from West Africa, I grew yes. up in London, studied here, all of these things. All of these things. And, so I, and I guess that's why I was sort of asking that question. Um, about how all of these influences come together um, in in one's work, um, and you you then go on to start to apply your thinking, this ecological thinking, to yes. to the tower. Yes. Um, and I wondered where that fascination came from. That's some, that's another thing that we have in common. So I yeah. started off in engineering, very fascinated by towers and just just as kind of sheer um, feats of engineering, but I wondered what, it, what, what interested you about them? Well, I started business in 1976, so, um, and uh, it was extremely difficult to persuade anybody, any client, you know, no matter how close you are with them, to do ecological design. And so the only way I could bring ecological design gradually is climatic design. So about climate design means, you know, designing with the climate of locality. So I did design like an armature so that later on I could convert it into an ecological building, a construction because it. One of the things I concluded was that the, build, the high rise building form is not going to go away overnight. People will, you know, continue to build it. So I thought, if you have to build it, Let's make it as green as possible. So that's, that was you know, the area that occupied me for about three or four years. And it wasn't until late 90s, early 90s, that people ex got into ecological design and, or, in, or sustainable design. So by the year late 90s, 1998, 2000, you know, somebody just jumped up and said, oh, let's design sustainable buildings. Then mechanical engineers got into it. And so, you know, all sorts of uh, criteria were created. The Briam, Lead, Caspi in China, and, uh, and, and, um, and, so, and other systems. So they Green, Green Mark in Singapore. But they were both all technologically driven. They're talking about water savings, they're talking about energy savings, they're talking about some little bit about using local materials, but very little about ecology. Even though if you look at Briam criteria, you know, there is actually one of the topics, which is ecology. But I contend ecology drives everything. It is the, uh, it is the baseline for everything that we do, we take place, you know. Because in nature, everything's connected. And so um, that became the topic, and it was my, it was my doctoral th th dissertation. And it just drove our work. Now, it wasn't easy, and I'm telling you, all of you this, because you're students, that Schools of architecture don't teach you how to do business. As soon as you leave architecture school, you know, you may be a top student, you set up business. But if you don't understand the business of architecture, within a short while, you go bankrupt. You know, you run out, you run out of, you know, shackles. It's happened to one or two. Yeah, okay. Architects. And so, um, what I did within the first six months of starting business, I realized that you, um, you weren't taught how to do business. So I went to business school. I went to business classes in the evening. 
people learn about, you know, marketing and learn about leadership, learn about delegation, learn about staffing, learn about controlling, you know, learn about income tax and all, all the aspects that we had to learn. It changed my whole life, okay? Because I was fighting against the competition of the, you know, the big four big firms in Kuala Lumpur, and they all did business intuitively. Now what happens if you learn to, uh, how to do business and marketing systematically? It doesn't guarantee you success, but it gives you a chance to, gives you the opportunity to, 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 to catch up and to find out what's wrong and to, and to give feedback to yourself and correct your system. So, that, that, so that, that changed my business life. Not until 2001 when they had recession in Malaysia, I went to Harvard Business School to do the course on how to lead a professional service. I should, when I finished that course, I felt I should have done it 20 years er earlier because, uh, again, you know, it, it, it was such different, changed my mindset about doing business architecture. Um, and and that, that's fascinating because, we, so we were talking about this earlier and I was, I was telling you that I'm a terrible business person. I'm well, I don't know about that. Either. I'm a terrible <laughs> business person. Well, um, get, get you keep drunk and take advantage of him, you know. <laughs> but I, I, um, I was thinking about the fact that, you know, as you've just said, architect, uh, business isn't something that architects are explicitly taught during their time at architecture school. Um, and, I, and I was wondering about, um, and it's something I'll come back to, but how you, um, how you manage to keep these two strands going. So this strand of intense research and continually sort of developing this thesis in parallel with being obviously a, you know, a successful business person because you've managed to be an architect, not go bankrupt, um, you know, build some big buildings and you know, you're, you're still kind of doing it well, X decades know. later. Um, and I wondered, you know, that might be a kind of lesson for the next generation is how, is how you keep those two strands going because it's I don't know, I think it's been extremely difficult. You know, um, has it been easy? No. As Kermit the Frog says, it's not easy being green. <laughs> um, well, I think business school you learn a number of things. One of the first things you learn is Pareto's Law. You wear Pareto's Law. Uh, expand, no, I'm a Sorry? bad business person. Pareto was an Italian economist in the 18th century. He found out, if he concluded that 20% of a business does gets 80% of the business. It's the 80% which is scrambling to get the 20%. And so, you know, the idea then was, to, you know, I said, oh, that, that's the case, then I need to be in the 20%. Mm -hmm. So with 20%, I was able to get part of the 80%. But that was some time ago. So then I learned about the American Express uh, um, law. American Express law said 2%. The 2% of all the card holders in American Express are the big earners. And so what I want to do is to move from 20% to the 2% to get the cream of, of the projects. That's what I'm trying to do now. To move from 20% to, uh, from 100% from to 20%, 20% to 2%. To, so to so that, that, that is my, that, that yeah, okay, very, very yeah. And, uh, to and move so from bespoke to, um, move from commodity to be a commodity to a bespoke product. That, 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 that's interesting, that yeah. I'm thinking about that idea of yeah. architecture yeah. potentially as a, as, as a commodity, which, yes. which is something right. I'd like to come back to and where it kind of sits in, yes. um, in the economic system. Yes. And, and we talked a little bit about power um, in relation to that. But I have one, um, one thing I'd like to ask you. We were yes, talking about, about the tower, um, and this is a... It, 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 it's a difficult question, but I, you know, so I talked about being fascinated by towers in a very abstract sense, you know, the way we, we kind of work as engineers or as I was working at that time, yeah. bending moments, la la la. But obviously towers, um, they, you know, they, they don't exist in isolation. Um, they're part of a wider yes. um, biological, ecolo um, yeah. bi biological ecology and also a social one. Yeah. And in a city like London, I think uh, it's difficult to think about the tower without thinking about the socio-political context, um, which is you know a bit like New York or Chicago. Um, 
you have, I, I would argue, going to simplify it, you have kind of maybe two broad strands of towers, which is this idea of the, the sort of capitalist towers. So you, your Swiss Rees, your Shards, your, um, your walkie-talkies, they all have such fantastic yes, names. And then you have this kind of modernist vision, the kind of Balfron um, tower and so on. And then, of course, in London, um, these days, you know, it's difficult to talk about towers without talking about Grenfell. And the reason I raise it is because, um, you know, there is this abstract idea of the tower. Um, but I, I wonder what you think about the socio-political context. Um, because, because Grenfell arguably, um, we talked about cladding, and it's not so much that that I'm asking you about. It's more, um, you know, the wider thing that it represents and the regulatory system that it sits within. Um, and, and, you know, and these things that surround it. And I wonder what your wider thoughts are on, on towers, and specifically that socio-political. Well, um, I've gone off towers, you know, a few years back. I thought they were most, um, they cost a third more, uh, you know, cost, a, you know, several times more than a conventional low-rise building, uses a third more energy materials, and it's, um, I tried to make it as green as possible. But um, I don't know how to answer your question. The Grenfell Tower is because of the cladding, which is, you know, which, which spread the fire, like, you know, spreads uh, flames like wildfire. But I think, as going back to my second slide, the purpose of architecture is really to make people happy. If whatever we do, and making a, a building green is, it's almost automatic, it's mechanical. So, you know, making buildings green is not, not that difficult. Or it's difficult, but everybody claims to do it now. You know, um, I go around the world and ask, you know, do you do green architecture? Every architect says they do green architecture, whether to a greater or less extent. But I think it's probably important that making people happy is uh, one of the most difficult things, one of the most important crucial things we have to do with a piece of architecture. Yeah. I did a house some time back for an Australian family, and the, uh, the critic asked them, what do you think of this house, Mr. Reynolds? And he said, we live in paradise. And when the you know, critic told me about that, it just really made my day, and I thought, my God, the whole purpose of being an architect is justified. The other day I was, and it doesn't, it doesn't mean, you know, making people happy doesn't, I mean, you have to spend, you know, you, know, you have to need, don't need a pile of dollars to do it. You know, the other day I was in Bordeaux, and between the road and the waterfront, there's a patchy green area. What the, what the architect did was to create a square of, uh, of, uh, of covered with granite, which is about six inches lower than the uh, existing level. And that throughout this square, there didn't sprouts. And every few minutes, the sprouts blows up a mist of air, a mist of water into the air, and the whole square was covered, you know, uh, with, with, you know, that's in the, that's in the uh, advertisement, it says frothy, it's very frothy, and, you know, and, it, and people were running around, there were about 200 people, you know, being happy there, having a good time. It doesn't cost a lot of money to do this. And so the idea of making people happy, you know, doesn't cost an arm and a leg, but, well, that's the purpose of architecture. So if you're able to do this, whether in a tower built form, a medium high rise built form, or a low rise built form, if you're able to create, make people happy, then it fulfills your whole purpose and rationale of being an architect. Because that's what you're supposed to do, make that, people happy by design. Indeed, that, yeah. this, this, this is why we get up in the morning. And, and I think that, um, you know, in the current context, like, post-pandemic, I think this is something that we've grown to understand more, is the yes. kind of importance of right. quality of space, which is what you're, you're talking about. Right. Um, and, and, you know, what would be wonderful to see is that, is that, is, is everybody having access to what you're talking about, right? Yes. Beautiful spaces, green spaces. Happy um, spaces. Happy spaces, exactly. Right. Um, and I, I, I wonder, um, we will open this, this up, um, 
to the to the floor. Oh no! <laughs> but I wonder, <laughs> people will be will will, will be. Um, I'm sure there there are lots of questions, and people will be kind. Um, but you know, I'm wondering. Um, so, I, I'm wondering about your vision applied to, or aspects of your vision applied to a city like London. So, for example, uh, we talked about. Um, so, so you talk about things like an ecological nexus and about creating habitats and linkages. I wonder how you do that um, in, a, in a context like London where you're, where you're largely retrofitting. So for example, I don't know, could we apply this to the, the aforementioned buildings, the Swiss Re, the Shard, and you know, these other kind of glittering towers. But also just as, as a kind of, um, I just wonder how e you know, eco-mimicry works in, the context where you're reworking a city. You talked a little bit about that. Well, um, you know, made of my David Chip, if you got knighted, I think, you know. Indeed. And uh, on our television program, is that we just have to build differently now. Mm. We can't build the same way, you can't design the same way. That's the same, that's what we need to do. Now, back to an earlier diagram that I showed, to make London green, you have to, um, improve its biological structure. Now, if you cannot connect all the green spaces from Hyde Park to Green Park to uh, Regent's Park, you have to do it through what I call the stepping stone relationship. Have a series of in-between green areas that slowly link it. It won't enable all species to move. It won't remake London into a constructed ecosystem in entirety, but heading towards it. You know, that's, that's my first thought. Then we look at the energy infrastructure, as I said, you know. If the infrastructure that we have now is not green, the city will never be green. So don't look at buildings as just trying to solve a problem at the, at the micro level. Solve the problem at the macro level, and let's try to make the city green. Look at the energy systems, look at the, look at the biological structure, look at its um, infrastructure. Where does the water come from? Where does the energy come from? Where does the sewage go? You know, all, this is all part of the infrastructure. But unless we make that green, you know, whichever brilliant architect you have who designs a green building here, you know, uh, wherever, um, it's not going to make any difference. It's, it's isolated, so it's a kind of whole, yeah, wholesale yeah. reworking that we that we need. Well, almost. that's my thought anyway. So. <laughs> no, I, I, I think lots okay. of people would would agree with you. Um, and I'm going to see whether there are any questions in the audience in this this very kind of patient, Yeah, if I could just follow from what you were just asking, um, given that these days, because of the economic problems and so on, yes. do you think all the things that you described are likely to happen in the UK in the foreseeable future? Because the, in, the, the finance might not be there to improve all the buildings that you are talking about, or to the micro level, you know, improving the, the, the green spaces and so on. And the argument will always be there are better. At the moment, anyway, there are more urgent issues resolved than focus on these issues. Although the long term, what you described, is, is the way forward. We we'll have to find ways to increase this biodiversity. Um, we have to do the ecological survey of London. It's uh, Biotic constituents, the abiotic constituents. At the moment, it's almost 100%, 99% abiotic. And so we have to find out what species are existing in London, uh, particular to this geographical location, and to enhance it and to make London, before London became London, it was, you know, it was marshland, it was you know, what it was, and, and it was a forest. And so we, uh, we need to make nature whole again. That's what we should try and do. Of course, that's easier said than done, but um, that's a challenge. Thank you for your really interesting talk. Um, what really caught my eye was your two extremes views. Not, I wouldn't say extremes, two sides of the same coin, I would say. Um, you talked about Pareto's law and trying to strive in terms of architectural and business to be within that 2 or 20 percent, but you also um, touched upon the green regulation and how that should be taught, um, viewed as a baseline, not a goal for buildings. But as, um, so this question in two parts, what would you say 
as advice to the two extremes where people are aiming for the green regulation as well as the people who are on top designing for these buildings, what would be your advice to them when designing for the future, like buildings of the future? Or, and specifically to us, like students who are going into architecture, who will be starting at the very bottom, what are some advice you could give us in terms of like following up with your ideal of like um, eco-mimicry? Well, that's five questions and one question. You know. <laughs> um, so like in advice to the very top, like say the big four you could name to them, like what would you tell them about eco-mimicry? Um, advice to us who will be starting at the very bottom, what we could change from there, as well as advice in terms of regulation and how we could approach that. Um, well, uh, uh, most practicing architects will tell you that being an architect is a miserable life. <laughs> Long hours, inadequate remuneration, you know. Um, so if you want to be an architect, you've got to have the passion for it. You know, you've done it and that you must tolerate all the rubbish that comes to be an architect, to be an architect. Otherwise, why bother? You know, you probably make more money selling hubcaps. Um, so, my advice is that if you want to be an architect, when you leave the AA, learn how to do business. You know, um, learn marketing. The four pieces, the five pieces of marketing, product, price, place, promotion, program. And that changes over time. You know, when I learned marketing back in 1976, the marketing today is totally different. It's all electronic. You do search engine optimization, social media optimization, um, and uh, you know mass communication. You know through the software that that sends out a thousand emails to your potential clients. You know in a couple of hours. I mean, you know, it's, it's incredible. You know, the day to day we do marketing is very different. In those days, uh, you know, the marketing, you know, you know, you know, as a rule of thumb. Um, and every few years or so, I'm, I'm, I'm part of this consultant to come and tell me, what am I doing right? What am I doing wrong? What should I do? And this gentleman, he's, you know, his name is Doug Dean. He comes, you know, and and he comes and tells me, there are five things you have to do with your business. First thing, you've got to be unique. If it's not unique, then you're a commodity, right? Is a commodity, the unique is going to be topical. You know, must be on, other, on, a, on everybody's lips. Then unique is going to be relevant. If you're unique, you know, designing, you know, operating theatres where, you know, that, that not that many people operate theatres to do to, then it's not relevant. Got to be unique, got to be topical, got to be relevant. It's got to be credible. If you say you do this, people are going to believe you can do this. And the last is the most difficult one. It's got to be motivating. Got to be unique, got to be topical, got to be relevant, got to be credible, motivating. If you're able to solve these, you're three quarters of the way there. You know, and you keep learning things. The other day, I came across a, a, a bit of advice from a marketing friend. He says that the cover of your brochure must indicate 75% of your offering. Don't let people read the brochure because they understand what you're offering. It should be on the cover. How to summarize that on the cover? And I said, Mauro. That's a challenge. That's a great know. piece of advice. That's a challenge, um, you know, how to do that, you know. Indeed. Yes. Um, but it, it, um, it strikes me that what you're talking about it isn't, you know, it's not something that we're taught in architecture school still, no. this, this, this idea yeah. of how you, how you create a successful business, which yeah. arguably one needs to do in order to survive and all of those things yeah. and, you know, tackle in part at least to tackle this work-life balance that you talk about but I, I was just interested in the second part of that question yes ma'am which is which is linked to what architecture schools teach and and I wondered whether you think uh, that in, in order to tackle these big ecological questions um, because the question was partly about um, the sort of boxes that one you know that one has to t 
tick. And I wonder, you know, which we are kind of taught about and, you know, regulation is sort of moving towards addressing yes, sir. climate change. But I wonder whether you think that architecture schools, since we're in one, whether you think they need to be more radical in their pedagogy in order to tackle these, these questions and in, in order to equip students um, to be, you know, in order to equip students to to tackle these, these well, big questions? You know, uh, there the are several types of architectural schools. That's the mainstream, like uh, the provincial schools. We teach how to be a, just a good architect. We learn how to detail, learn how to uh, design, learn how to do solve problems. And there are the schools that want to make you into their superstar. Mm. So, um, I, I, you know, it depends on which you know, school you go to. But I don't think an architectural school should teach you to become radical. I think in architecture school, if we were to be truly concerned about climate change, about saving the planet, you've got to change your pedagogy, as you, pedagogy, as you said, you change your curriculum. You have to learn ecology. If you don't learn ecology, you don't understand how things happen. Just Some like it's just like if you do a business course. If you do a business course, you know, you walk to any, any restaurant, you don't look at the menu. You certainly look at restaurants, there's how many people are sitting there, what's the price of the menu, where the location, what's the number of customers. Straight there, within 20 minutes in your head, you worked out how much they're, going to make, they're making, you know. So that's why it's important to do business course, to understand how to do business. But I think if you're really concerned about the future of the planet, study ecology, that means ecology has to be in the curriculum of a school of architecture. When it was in the curriculum, then we learn materials, we teach materials, you're not learning about the weather, you're learning about how connection, you're learning about the life cycle material, how to recycle, how do you use it again, what is the embodied energy in taking the you know the you know the material from the ground or wherever it is into the building, what is the cost of energy, what's the life cycle implication. Um, so when you teach um, environmental systems, it's not about uh, you know um, air conditioning, it has to do as I mentioned Biochromatic design, try to make it passive mode, low energy in the first instance. Mixed mode, how to make it even lower energy by using partial energy systems. Full mode, and how to use smart systems using uh, using low embodied energy systems. And 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 um, productive mode, how can we generate energy from from, from the um, you know from the uh, Without, without, without burning fossil fuels. Indeed. But so, some might see that as, I mean, it, you know, as you, as you talk you about it, 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 it makes sense to me, but some might see that as, you know, quite radical because at the moment, so, you know, we're starting to think about, okay, you know, yeah. life cycles, you know, whole, whole life cycles when yeah. we talk about buildings, but it still sits kind of somewhere outside the main curriculum in most schools. So that's why I was wondering, yeah. you know, what, what, whether you thought the approach needed to, to change somewhat. Um, the well, change is with, the, with all of you because you have to leap up and go to back to the head of school and says we've got to change the curriculum if we want to save the planet. That would be quite radical. You know, but, but you know, <laughs> I, I know what will happen. You know, 20 minutes to leave the room, you go and have your lunch, and I said, oh, well, you know, I had a good chat with Ken, you know, that's about it, I think. You know. um, I be, wonder if be there, the there, agents there are of change. More, more questions. Be the agents of change. Be the agents of change. Yes. The great thing to leave right. with. Hi, thank you very much for how you took. Um, it was um, a lot of very wonderful example of building uh, with integrated greenery into it. And thank um, you. I think everyone walk um, in cities, and sometimes you see such a building, but the greenery has died or has passed away in a way. Um, and I was wondering what you take on the management of this system or the maintenance of this system. And um, you take on on new technologies such as sensor network um, integrated into architecture, and why that not happening more often, or what is the barrier at the moment or the limitation for this implementation to help with integration of greenery into our built environment? Well, again, that's five questions in one question. <laughs> I think the answer is an innovation. You know, you have to be constantly innovate to uh, to push the boundaries of what you're doing. Whether it is finding ways of um, putting greenery in buildings, uh, improving the uh, the biointegration of the organic with the inorganic, um, 
you know that that is the challenge. I, I, I I'm still looking for the answer. Um, and, but I think innovation, looking at whatever issue you have, and be able to extend its boundary and innovate. That's what is, it requires a certain mount, mindset to do this. You know, some people just you know lock their minds and you know think, oh, this I've done it in the past. I'll do the same thing again. You know. But you should ask yourself, how could I do it better? How could I do something that will benefit humanity without causing more issues? So that's my answer. I don't know how to answer your question in detail, but I think innovation is the, is the, is the mindset, is the, is the strategy that we should have. It's at the top of marketing. You know, the other day I was talking to uh, somebody the other day and he said, um, Five, ten years ago, people used to market on efficient delivery. That means, use me as an architect, I can do the project for you, I can do it fast, I can do it within cost, within budget, and I do it very quickly. But those days are gone because everybody says they do that. Everybody says, you know, I'm a good architect because I deliver on time, I do budget, I'm very efficient, I do quick drawings. So the next level of differentiation and the secret of marketing is differentiation, is um, specialization. I have a friend who says, I specialize in shopping malls. I specialize in doing this. You know, Kayan says, I specialize in green buildings. Everybody does green buildings. Everybody specializes in shopping malls. So the second level of differentiation is gone. So what is the third level of differentiation? The current level of differentiation is innovation. You know. You employ Mr. Architect, you get innovative ideas. You get a dozen of them, you know? And that, to me, is the, uh, that's the next level of marketing. And that's why I was asking you a question, you know? As a student, you have to think out of the box. You have to, you know, you have to, you know, you want to be the best that you can be, you know, that you can, uh, you can do better than the next person. And the secret business is really focused. The secret of architecture, the secret of academy, academic is focused because you can study a number of things. Like friends, you have many friends, but you can only focus on a few that are very meaningful, important to you. So with subject, you can study many topics, just focus on a few that are important to you. And that's the story of my life. I focus on ecological design, I don't do anything else, and I just try and do it better than anybody else. So the secret of success in anything is focus and innovation, you know. And so you can ask a lot of questions about this and this and this, but focus on one or two things. And do that extremely well. Do it better than anybody else. We, we have another question. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, thank you for your presentation and your talk. Uh, my question is about uh, frugality. Uh, it's what, sorry? Frugality. Frugality. Yes. So uh, yes. you see frugality as a potential strategy in uh, design or like there was this talk about a need for a shift in paradigm uh, when we are talking about pedagogy but also in the way you uh, interact with your clients when you are formulating brief or making certain design decisions. Uh, do you potentially see frugality as an approach? you know, to change the mindset, because as we have seen, you know, we could do with a lot less. Well, I think that's important. You've got to have a much more visceral approach to design and visceral, uh, to doing things. It means doing more with less. Um, that's, a, that's an important factor. I agree with you completely. Because it may go against, uh, let's say, the economic sustainability a project is supposed to obtain over a period of time. Sorry, could you say that again? So, or do you think that it goes against the idea of the economic sustainability uh, that is also a purpose of uh, the project? Uh, at well, it's like, um, you know, it's like some people like to live in very simply and some people like to live, you know, extravagantly. Um, you can encourage people to be frugal, 
But at the end of the day, you know, different strokes of different folks. You know, some people just like this, something like that. But you, but I like the idea of of uh, of living simply. For instance, I don't have anything that that I cannot use. If you buy things that you cannot use, then it's it's just a waste of money. You know. You know, I mean, like, I don't know if you, I I don't buy. Clothing more than I need. I got five white shirts. I got six handkerchiefs. You know, four socks and two pairs of shoes. And that's it. That's all I need, right? You know. Thank you. I, I, I can't. You should can't see the white shirts that I have when I get torn. The tailor, you know, you know, the tailor sort of, you know, repairs it. And the people see me. What's this little, little grid on your shirt? I said, it's 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 a fashion statement. <laughs> Well, I mean, things are move, moving that way. This, you know, this this idea of sustainability and fashion repurposing, reusing. So you're kind of again ahead of the trend, ahead of the curve. Yes. Um, um, there's one question on YouTube. I mean, I think it's probably going to be the last question, but I'm just going to read it out. Um, they've asked, do you think that the excessive amount of the island reclamation projects that we see around the world goes against the principles of biomimicry? So, could you, sorry, Danny, could you just give me that question yeah, again? Yeah, um, they've asked if you think that the excessive amount of island reclamation projects that are going on around the world goes against the principles of biomimicry. Island reclamation? I don't Land rec island reclamation. Yes, yeah, so I don't understand, I don't understand why you need to reclamate, rec or, you know, reclaim island because there's so much land in, 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 the, in the planet already. People reclaim islands because for profitable reasons. They want to claim more land, they can make more money out of waterfront properties. Right? You don't need to do that if you have plenty of land. You have optimized you have you need to optimize existing land use. Then you realize that London doesn't really need to expand its boundaries because there are a lot of interstitial spaces that you could actually use and optimize. And, um, and a better use. So if you ask me what I think, I said forget about island reclamation unless it is to save some species or to preserve the waterfront, you know, uh, ecology. You know, <laughs> you know so it's, it's mostly for commercial reasons, this island reclamation. Unless, like what you're doing in Maldives now, what the, uh, the Chinese are helping Maldives to stop the island from getting um, you know, the rising water level to, to destroy the island. You have to have structures, you know, off the edge of the island to, to protect it from being uh, overrun with uh, rising water level. You know, I don't even know about that jo project in Johor where, you know, so they're, they're reclaiming three islands. I, I don't understand that, I don't see the logic of it. That's a three island project in Penang. You know, what do they need to do that? And it's got plenty of land. But, you know, as you know, um, before you can exchange money, you've got to have a project. So you have a project, so you know, somebody's going to stuff the pockets. So that's, uh, so forget about the island reclamation. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's very fun talking to all of you, and uh, especially, you know, uh, Sarah, and the uh, smartest girl I know. Um, and don't forget, have a good life. <laughs> <laughs> learn ecology. Big thank you to, to both <laughs> of you for this really fascinating conversation. Yeah, learn ecology. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for having us. Okay.